Well, I've been preaching about the lion and the lamb. And today, I want to continue on that same theme. I've just called the message, The Lion of Judah. In Revelation chapter 5, let's turn in the scriptures together. You know, when Karen said that they might make preaching the full gospel a hate crime, I'd be guilty. No doubt about it. Revelation 5 verse 4, jo John is caught up into heaven, and of course, he sees this scroll. And in verse 4, he says, and I wept very much because no one was found worthy to open and read the book, nor to look at it. And then one of the elders said to me, do not weep, for behold, the lion, come on somebody, of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has prevailed to open the book and to loose the seven seals of it. The lion of Judah has prevailed. Can we say that together? The lion of Judah has prevailed. That word prevailed means to defeat an opponent, especially in a long or difficult contest. It means to gain ascendancy through strength or supremacy. In just a couple of weeks, we're going to be celebrating the greatest miracle in the history of all the world, the resurrection of, come on, of Jesus Christ. How many of you know Satan has been defeated at Calvary? Come on. Satan has been defeated at Calvary. The lion of Judah has prevailed. Hallelujah. Go with me to 1 Peter chapter 5. My first point is simply this. Which roar are you listening to? Which roar are you listening to? 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 6, Peter says, Therefore, humble yourself under the almighty hand of God so that in due time, not in you time, in due time, he may raise you up and exalt you, casting all your care, all your anxiety onto him, for he cares for you. And then he says this in verse 8, be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. I love this in verse 9. Whom resist steadfastly in the faith. See, there's the lion of Judah, but then Satan is not a creator. He's a counterfeiter. And he goes about as a roaring lion. The only thing is, it says in Psalm 2, the Lord knocked his teeth out. So he may have a growl, but he doesn't have a bite. Come on. There are two voices in our life. There's the roar of the enemy and it's always filled with lies. But he wants to intimidate. He wants to scare us and put fear in us. He wants to try to tell us what he's going to do to us. But then there's the roar of 
of the Lion of Judah. And I want to ask you today, whose report are you going to believe? You're going to believe the roar of the enemy? No way. We need to resist him steadfastly in the faith. And we need to believe the report of the Lord. Somebody shout, I believe the report of the Lord. Now, when you study lions, lions that want to destroy their prey, they will always seek out the isolated and the weak. That is why you and I have got to stay in fellowship, stay connected, stay plugged in, because if the enemy can get you to pull away, if he could get you to be singled out, if he could get you to be isolated, it is easier for him to go after you. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verses 4 and 5. 1 Corinthians 2, verses 4 and 5. The Apostle Paul writes, And my speech and my preaching, it was not with enticing words of man's wisdom. Oh, I love this. But in the demonstration of the Spirit and of power. Somebody shout power. power. Dunamis, power. So that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. See, too often when you and I are in a battle, when you and I face a challenge, when you and I are in a struggle, too often, we depend on our own strength, on our own ability. You know, I'll figure this out. I'll get the job done. I'll work this out. You and I cannot depend on ourselves. We cannot rely on our own ability. That's not God's will for our lives. We've got to put our trust in the Lord and rely on his power to do it. God never does it the way we think he's going to do it. Remember Naaman in the Bible? He was a leper. And the servant girl heard that Elijah the prophet was in town. And she says to him, why don't you go see the man of God? And maybe you'll get your miracle. So Naaman goes to see Elijah. And Elijah basically gives him a word and says, go jump in the lake. Go jump in the river. And Eli or Naaman was mad. And here's what he says. He says, I thought. How many know that's dangerous? When you think you know how it's going to get done, God never does it the way I thought. He said, I thought the man of God was going to come into me. I thought the man of God was going to lay hands on me. I thought he was going to do it this way. And God uses that little servant girl. And she says to Naaman, Naaman, why don't you just obey what the man of God is asking you to do? And he finally went and jumped into the dirty river seven times. And when he came up the seventh time, he was healed and delivered and received his miracle. But he almost missed it 
because he said, I thought. Whose roar are you listening to? Whose voice are you listening to? The 23rd Psalm says, God set a table before me, but where is it? It's in the presence of my enemies. Now, how many know you and I got a choice? We could either focus on the buffet table or focus on the enemy. I'm choosing to focus on the table the Lord has laid out for me and I resist the roar of the enemy. Come on, come on, come on. I, I know we turned our clocks an hour ahead and you lost an hour of sleep, but don't take it out on God this morning. Let's get excited about his word. Let's get excited about the promises of God. Let's get excited about the things of God. And then when you go home after church, take your nap. Let's go to the book of Daniel chapter 6. My second point is this. He shuts the mouth of the lion. He shuts the mouth of the lion. Now, Daniel was a very strong, committed follower of God. And he was seeing a lot of favor in the kingdom. Darius loved him. And he really valued him. And in Daniel chapter 6, verse 3, it says, Then this Daniel was made overseer of the presidents and the satraps. I love this. Because an excellent spirit was in him. How many of you know if you and I want God's best, we need to give him our best? God doesn't want our leftovers. He doesn't want, you know, our time when we're all tired and worn out. He wants the best we have. He wants our first fruits. He wants us to seek first the kingdom of God. And Daniel gave God his best. But it says, and the king was planning to set him over all the kingdom. He was up for this huge promotion. But then in verse 4, the presidents and the rulers sought to find occasion against Daniel, but they could find no occasion or fault because he was faithful. I said he was faithful. Neither was there any error or fault found in him. Then the men said, we're not going to find any occasion against Daniel. So they went to King Darius. And they basically said, oh, king, why don't you make a royal decree that anybody that prays or worships any other god but you, but you has to be thrown into the lion's den? Well, they persuaded and convinced Darius to do that. So he sets a royal decree and puts his signet ring on it, which means it could never be changed. It said, if anybody prays or worships any other God but me, he'll be thrown into the lion's den. In verse 8, he says, Now, O king, establish the ban and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed. Verse 9, Therefore, King Darius signed the writing in the ban. And when 
he had learned that the document was signed, Daniel went to his house and his windows were open in the roof room toward Jerusalem and he knelt down on his knees three times a day and prayed and gave thanks before his God just like he did before. Even though Daniel knew it was against the law, even though he knew he was going to get thrown into the lion's den, Daniel chose to honor God rather than men. And he prayed faithfully, boldly three times a day. So, of course, all the men assembled. They found out Daniel was praying. They go back to King Darius. They said, oh, king, we know you like Daniel, but he's defied your law. And you need to throw him into the lion's den. And so, verse 14, then the king, when he heard the word, he was very much displeased. And he set his heart on Daniel to deliver him. And he labored until sundown to deliver him. Then these men met before the king and said to the king, no, O king, the law of the Medes and the Persians, it cannot be changed. So the king commanded that they bring Daniel and throw him into the lion's den. And the king answered and said to Daniel in verse 16, Your God, whom you always serve, will deliver you. Now, isn't it interesting? Darius is the one that throws him into the lion's den, but he's also the one believing that God's going to deliver him out of the lion's den. Go figure. Verse 17, and the stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring so that it could never be changed. And the king went to the palace and he, he spent the night fasting. And diversions were not brought before him and his sleep fled from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning and he hurried to the lion's den. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a grieved voice to Daniel. And the king spoke and said to Daniel, O Daniel, servant of the living God, is your God, whom you always serve, able to deliver you from the lions? Come on, somebody. Daniel said, O king, live forever. I'm still here. Come on. I'm still here. My God has sent his angel and he has shut the lion's mouths and they have not hurt me because before him purity was found in me and also before you, O king, I've done no harm. And the king was exceedingly glad and he commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den so Daniel was taken up out of the den and no kind of hurt was found on him. Listen to this. Because he trusted in his God. Now, if you go on to read the story, the men that conspired against Daniel, Darius took them and their families and threw them in the lion's den and they were devoured and eaten and killed. The gallows that were built for Mordecai, come on. Haman ended up hanging on the same gallows that he built to kill Mordecai. Now let me share these four truths out of this story. Number one, 
It says Daniel distinguished himself. You and I need to distinguish ourselves. We need to set ourselves apart unto God. Number two, he prayed continuously. He even prayed when he knew it was against the law. Number three, Daniel had an excellent spirit. He gave God his best. How I many you know we need to give God our best? I said, we need to give God our best. And number four, he trusted in his God. Now, if God can do that to natural lions, how I many you know we all at times have people in our lives that the enemy uses to speak negative things, to speak lies about us, to try to stir up trouble in our life, to speak things that we know are contrary to God's will, word, curses, whatever you want to call them. I'm here to tell you, if God is able to shut the mouth of the natural lions, my God is able to shut the mouth of the lions in our lives as well. Somebody give God a shout of praise. Hallelujah. I'm talking to somebody right now that you got somebody in your life that is bad-mouthing you in the strong name of Jesus Christ. Shut the mouth of the lions. Lord, zip their lip. Come on. Come on. Hallelujah. Number three, I'm just going to simply call it the roar of the Lion of Judah. I want you to give your attention to the video screen for just a moment. I want to show you this clip. It's from the movie The Lion the Witch and the Wardrobe. It is a C.S. Lewis classic. And it's, it's the story about a witch. And then there's a lion in the story named Aslan. And the witch, as we're going to see in this short clip, kills Aslan the lion. But God raises him back up again. Watch this. We should go. What have they done? <laughs> but we saw the knife. The witch. But the witch knew the true meaning of sacrifice. She might have interpreted the deep magic differently. That when a willing victim who has committed no treachery is killed in a traitor's stead, 
the stone table will crack, and even death itself would turn backwards. We sent the news that you were dead. Peter and Edmund will have gone to war. We have to help them. We will, dear one, but not alone. Climb on my back. We have far to go, and little time to get there. And you may want to cover your ears. <laughs> The same power that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you and me. Come on. Come on. The enemy is defeated. Hear the roar of the Lion of Judah. I don't know if you heard him, but he laughed. Aslan laughed. Psalm 2 says, why do the heathens rage and the people meditate on a vain thing? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers plot together against the Lord and against his anointed. Am I talking to any anointed in here this morning? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers plot together against the Lord and his anointed. Let us break their bands in two and cast away their cords from us. But verse 4 of Psalm 2 says, He who sits in the heavens shall laugh. Aslan said, If the witch only knew that when a sacrifice that has committed no sin is put to death, even death, even death, even death cannot hold them. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! I don't know what you're facing right now, I don't know what kind of struggle you may be going through. I don't know what kind of trial you're in. But I'm here to tell you that when it's all said and done, God will have the last laugh. I said God will have the last laugh. In two weeks, we are going to celebrate the glorious resurrection of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. The Lion of Judah lives inside of you. Let him out and let him roar. Let him out and let him roar. Let's all stand together.